Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me in the book of Luke, the book of Luke. In just a moment, we will be in chapter 9 and verse number 23. Luke chapter 9, verse number 23. A true journey always leads somewhere, and we are on a journey called life. So we're all heading somewhere. Now, I know that there's some romantic idea about just being this free-spirited wanderer, that I'm just, you know, I'm in a sense along for the ride. I'm just letting life take me wherever it leads. But, but quite frankly, there are not so many options in life as to say I'm, I'm just not going anywhere. It's, it's not one of those that has been part and parcel with your life. You're heading somewhere. You start to think about the, the options that are before us. Ultimately, there are only two destinations, and that is heaven or hell. Those are the only two. There's not a variety of places and, and a choice of conclusions, heaven or hell. There are only two directions. There is the broad way, and there is the narrow way. And there are only two to follow. Oh, I, I know that if I follow one, it means I'm following another, but there are ultimately only two to follow, and, and that is the Savior, Jesus, or self. Someone aptly said in a, in a short, memorable, poetic statement, there are just two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Over the last few weeks, we have been asking ourselves the question, where are you headed? And today, we bring that question to a conclusion with this message. And, and the answer to it today, where are you headed? The answer today that should be the answer to any follower of Christ. Now, if you know Christ personally, you may well call yourself a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian. The, the name itself means I'm a little Christ. I'm, I'm trying to live a life that is pleasing to Him. So if you are, by your own acknowledgement, a follower of Christ, then the conclusion to where are you headed should be wherever He leads. Wherever He leads. That means that I am turning over the course, the direction of my life to one that I have of my own admission said, I'm following him. So as followers of Christ, what does that start to look like and, and to what is he actually calling us? The terms, quite frankly, are high. And he doesn't, he doesn't confuse it. He doesn't paint it in some rosy hues, he says it quite directly. Your Bibles are open right now to Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We're going to break this down in, in three more general or broader statements, but today we're going to start out with some determinations. Determinations, who will I follow and where are they going? And then decisions, what is this going to cost? And then at least consider the accompanying distractions. What about other people? But let's begin today with the determinations, who will I follow where are they going? Let's begin under this determinations, 
who will I follow? This is, first of all, something that we'll mention as somewhat of an aside, but, but I hope it's fairly obvious, but let's say it so that we're certain. This is not an if you will follow. It is a who you will follow. It's not an if because all of us are going to follow someone. Now, now you might say, well, I'm following myself. Okay, you're still following a course that is laid out. And, and if we go no further than self, we are actually following, we might think, ourselves, but we're following a course that self always follows. It always ends in a specific conclusion. J Joshua said it this way. In Joshua chapter 24, verse number 15, he said, if it seemed evil to you to serve the Lord, he said, I acknowledge you may think that's a bad deal and I don't want to serve him. He says, okay, nobody's twisting your arm. You have to make that decision for yourself. If it seemed evil to you to serve the Lord, he says, okay, then choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood, the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. He said, go ahead, figure out who you're going to serve. You're going to serve someone, and if you've concluded, I'm going to serve me, then you're going to serve the gods of the world. He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, you're going to serve someone. This is not an if. It is an who are you going to to serve. So if you're going to follow Jesus, I, I would submit it's very important that we understand where is he going and who is he. So who is he? Well, the disciples did recognize that. In fact, in, in Luke chapter 9, which is a, a powerful passage of Scripture, it, it covers uh, some very significant events and then some significant transitions. But the disciples recognize something. If you back up a little bit in Luke chapter 9, look down at verse number 18. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said, well, well, this is what some people are saying. They're saying this and this and this. But that wasn't so important to Jesus as what did the disciples think? And so notice what he, what he says next. He says, but, okay, whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, the Christ of God. When you attach Christ to the person of Jesus, you have said a whole lot of truth. Christ, what does this mean? Well, it means anointed one chosen one. It means in no uncertain terms that, that Peter is acknowledging, Jesus, you are the one that we have been looking for. You are Messiah. What a statement. Now, the disciples recognize this, but all throughout Scripture, we have this, this affirmation from so many different sources as to who is this really? In fact, not only do the disciples recognize this, let's just back up a little bit and think through the angelic conclusion. This is who he is. The angel said it in Luke chapter 2, verse number 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is, here it is again, Christ the Lord. This is the one you've been looking for. You say, well, well, sure. So, so these are all people that are close to Jesus. The disciples say it. The angels say it. Yeah, well, listen to who else acknowledge it. The devils say it. The demonic host acknowledge he is the Christ. The Bible says it this way in Luke chapter 4, verse number 40 and 41. Now, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and he lay his hands on them, on every one of them, and healed them. Verse 41, and devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, thou art the Christ, the Son of God, and he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. 
You, you know, it's not only those who are trying to make Jesus something that they wanted him to be. Even the demonic host can do nothing but acknowledge, we know who you are. You are the Son of God. You are the Christ. Christ himself bears witness to the fact that I am exactly who you have said that I am. He acknowledges this in multiple places, but one of the places is, is in Luke chapter 4 when on the Sabbath day, Jesus goes into the synagogue and they hand him the scriptures and Jesus turns specifically to Isaiah chapter 61. And he begins to read verses 1 through 3 in our Luke passage. It's said this way, Jesus starts to read and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath, here it is, anointed me. There is some special anointing on Jesus Christ to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And all eyes, the Bible says, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. Can you imagine? I mean, it was when Jesus finishes, you could have literally heard a pin drop on that dusty stone floor in the synagogue. I mean, people are looking at him. Did he just say what we think he said? Yes, he did. This day, the scriptures fulfilled in your ears. The one you've been looking for, the promised one, Messiah, the anointed one, that's me. Let me ask you, do you know who Jesus is? If you know who he is, what implication does that have in your life? It's huge. We have to begin because we've got some important determinations to make. I better know who he is. Okay, so I know who you are. Now, Jesus, where are you going? Where are you going to lead me? If I'm following you, I want to know where are you headed? Good question. Again, in Luke chapter 9, we see one of the great benevolent miracles of Jesus. It was the feeding of the thousands. We, we refer to it as the feeding of the 5,000, but it's the, the feeding of the thousands. He takes a boy's little lunch, he breaks the bread, he, he breaks the fish, and thousands are fed. Now, let me ask you, knowing he's Messiah, who doesn't want a Messiah that can feed the thousands? Wow, the, the, the fame of Jesus just continues on this meteoric rise. We want that kind of Messiah. But this also, this wonderful miracle marks a shift in Jesus' ministry. It really is what some refer to as the conclusion of the great Galilean ministry, where Jesus now appears to singularly set his sights on a place where few would be willing to follow. What does Jesus start to say? Again, Luke chapter 9, if you're still there, look down at verse number 51. Luke number 51, he starts to set his sights on Jerusalem and something that is going to happen. It, it is part and parcel with heading toward Jerusalem, and that is the cross. Verse number 51, Luke 9, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Luke chapter 13, verse number 22, he continues it on. And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Luke chapter 17, verse number 11, and it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Luke chapter 18, verse number 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. There's no question about who is this man. This man is Messiah. Do you know who he is? Now, now, if you don't yet know Christ, you know about him, but you don't know him, then you should come to know him. He is the promised one. 
He is the, the lamb that had been pictured through thousands of sacrifices. Now comes the perfect, the final sacrifice, Jesus. He suffered and bled and died for your sin and for mine. He, he became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. He was satisfactory. He became the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sin. God, the Father, was satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. Have you accepted him as yours, a sufficient payment for your sin? Do you know who he is? He's, he's the promised one, the one that was coming to do what you and I could never do. The one that the Old Testament saints put their faith in the fact that he is coming. The one that we today in this New Testament world, we look back and we by faith say he is the promised one. Do you know who he is and have you accepted him? Okay, so there's some other determinations to make. I know who he is. Ooh, wow. Now I know where he's going he is heading toward the cross. Now think about the excitement that the disciples must have felt when they thought, hey, he's going to set up an earthly kingdom. I want to be a part of that. Oh, this is going to be great. Hey, Lord, when you set up your kingdom, can, can, uh, now don't tell the other, the, the other disciples, but can I sit on one side of you and my brother sit on the other? That This is going to be exciting. Oh, he's going to set up his kingdom. Okay, but Jesus keeps saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to Jerusalem for another purpose. When you start making these kind of determinations, it adds some weight to the consideration, um, um, where are you headed? Who are you prepared to say wherever he leads? If that involves Jerusalem, clearly Christ knew where he was going. Hey, hey, have you ever asked someone for directions before? Hey, do you know how to get to? And they say, yeah, 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 I think so. Let me see. Okay, I think so. I know we don't ask directions as much anymore because we, we, we ask our phone, you know, how do I get to wherever? But if you have to ask a person and they say, yeah, 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 I think I know. It's, oh boy, I was there years ago. Uh, let me see here. You go down to, let's see, there's an old filling station there. I think it's a taxi. No, it's an X. I don't remember what it is, but I think there's a filling station. Turn right at the filling station till you get to this chicken coop. And then at the chicken, okay, do you understand? Have you ever had directions like that before? Do you have a lot of confidence in those directions? Have you ever started to follow those directions and said, I am dead lost, okay? Do you know if you become a follower of Jesus, th there's not any question as to where he's going. And there is no question as to where he is calling you to follow. So the question for us, it is as good as it was for them that day. There should be no doubt as to where Christ is headed. He's headed toward the cross. The question left for the disciples is would they follow? And that's the question for you and for me today. And by the way, you can't be wrong about Jesus and right about God. You have to know who is Jesus. Wow, he's the promised one. If you're wrong about Jesus, I would submit you are also wrong about God. So know who he is. He's Messiah. Where is he going? Jesus knew who he was. He knew where he was headed. And there's something that's going to happen at that place, and it's called crucifixion. Let's go to the next point. The first is determinations. Who will I follow? Where are they going? The second, decisions. What is this going to cost? What is this going to cost? Now, we should ask those kinds of questions. They're important questions. How many of you have a spouse that doesn't ask questions about how much it costs? How many of you have them like that, okay? Like, oh, just, just, oh yeah, 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 get that and that and that and that and that. Listen, all of us should be a little more mindful of, okay, now, who, how, what's this going to cost me? Jesus uses this as a parable. He says, nobody that's going to war is going to say, hey, let's, let, let's go to war. Unless they first stood back a little bit and said, hey, hang on just a second. Do I have the sufficient strength to go to battle or am I going to be humiliated in the battle? Nobody that's intending to build a tower to build some structure goes, goes and says, come on, let's build. But they don't have any idea what's it going to cost me to do this. So Jesus now starts to elevate some things for us. We know who he is. We know where he's going. But now we have some decisions. What is this going to cost? 
Again, verse number 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, well, we know who you are. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Do you see how he breaks this up? He, he actually puts it into basically three sections to, to, to understand what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. The first one is the need to deny oneself. Okay, if you're going to come after me, then here's the beginning of that. Let him deny himself. Not denying the unique person that you are, not denying the special purpose for which you were created. Rather, this is a rejection of a life based on self-interest and self-fulfillment. How many of the decisions that we're making right now are based on, is this going to be pleasing to me? Is this what I want? Is this what will make me happy? I, I want to do this because my world is focused around this thing. Listen, if this is not part of my life, what happens to me? And what Jesus is saying is you're going to have to make some decisions and I'm going to lay out the information you need to make this decision because this is going to be a costly decision. And he doesn't try to hide that. He doesn't try to hide it from you. He didn't try to hide it from the crowds. Jesus is laying out the terms for being a follower of him, for us being able to say, hey, where are you headed? Wherever he leads. It is a life not centered on self, but on the Savior. The opposite of that is a life that is lived in an attempt to find happiness and satisfaction but it is in a sense like a dog chasing its own tail. It leads nowhere. It is cyclic. It is, it is this empty life of pursuing one thing and then the next and the next and the next. And then I, I find that I am circling in a sense, going nowhere, finding no true happiness. There is some emptiness about the life that says, I'm, I'm going to pursue that which makes me happy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the, the bigger house. I'm going to have the, the better car. I'm going to have this for my family. Do you know, even during holiday seasons, sometimes we work so hard to have the perfect holiday. Everything has to be just right. And when something doesn't happen to our understanding of perfection, it kind of throws the whole thing off because this is what I was wanting. This was, this was what was going to make the holidays perfect. But there's only one person that we can pursue that actually gives meaning, significance, purpose, if you will, genuine happiness to life. And it's not, it's not pursuing yourself. So he's helping us understand you're going to have to decide the cost is rather significant and you are not going to be the end of this whole thing. There's something beyond you. So he says, deny yourself. And then he goes on and he says, take up your cross. In the Roman world, the cross is a symbol of shame, of guilt, suffering, rejection who in Jesus day would use the cross as their symbol of victory but we sing about it today we we we, we emblazon it on things we we put it up as this picture this symbol this recognition of something that happened we wear it around our necks we we proclaim the cross but not in Jesus day for Jesus to tell his disciples take up your cross you, you want to talk about offensive. Can you imagine the Apostle Peter saying, hey, Jesus, uh, listen, if you start using that cross terminology around the crowds, people are going to stop following. And, and were we to, to follow this imaginary conversation through, we could hear Jesus say, Peter, that's the point. I want people to understand what's it going to cost me to follow him. And so, you know, we understand to begin, I have to deny myself, then I have to go a little bit further in that self-denial and actually pick up a cross. It's not just a matter of, I did it, okay, whew, I'm glad that's done. He adds the word daily. 
Take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, sometimes we, we conjure up the strength to do something that we didn't really want to do. Do you know, wouldn't it be nice if, if he said, take up your cross when I have one for you. Take up your cross should you come to the place where it's necessary. He says, take up your cross daily. In Luke chapter 9, verse 24, he says, for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. He seems to be deepening this understanding of there is a daily necessity of self-denial. This is a call to continually die to our selfish desires. I know I'm crucified once with Christ, but I must die every day to my personal desire. It's a call to say my convenient conclusions. Now, I have to come to this conclusion because that's convenient for me. Do you know today, many are trying to redefine all kinds of things because it's convenient to the conclusion I desire. But God doesn't do that. He says, no, 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 this is the conclusion. I'm not asking you to come to a convenient conclusion. I'm asking you to pick up the cross of self-denial. The cross that says, all right, Lord, I'm following you and I will take up my cross. Someone asked Tozer, A.W. Tozer, years ago, what does it mean to take up your cross? Tozer relayed to them a story of an old man and a young person. And here's how Tozer relayed it. One time a young man came to an old saint and said, what does it mean to be crucified with Christ? The old man thought for a moment, Tozer said, and then relayed Well, to be crucified means three things. First, the man who is crucified is facing only one direction. He can't turn around. He is nailed to a cross. He is only singularly directed. The old man scratched his scraggly head and said, Next, he is not going back. He said his final goodbyes. Thirdly, He said, the man on the cross has no further plans of his own. Those have come to a radical conclusion. He's facing one direction. He's not going back. He has no further plans of his own. Wherever Jesus went, he drew crowds. And when he fed them, he drew thousands. But as the message became more focused on the cost of discipleship, the more quickly the crowds began to thin. Are we ready to take up our cross when that means that we could lose some of our closest relationships? That it could cost us our jobs, our plans, our futures? Are we prepared to take up our cross when it means we could be alienated from our families? That we may forfeit some earthly pleasures that it could actually cost us our very lives. While these things may or may not be our reality, because the truth of the matter is, we in this room, and we watching by, by some other means, we understand that every day we're experiencing a, a, a whole host of comforts. I suspect that there are seasons and times when God has blessed generations with comforts and at other times what is perceived as cruelties. And usually the world is filled with both at the same time. Do you know, it's not that you're to feel guilty about your comforts. It's just that you're not to hold on to them so tightly that you say, these have become more important to me than the cost of discipleship. Thirdly, we see when we start to think about, okay, what is this going to cost? Well, denying himself, take up his cross daily. And then straightly, simply put, we follow Jesus. In Hebrews 12 too, he says very directly, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus means we're not looking elsewhere. And how does this conclude? With distractions. And this is not overly complicated, Distractions. What about other people? There was a time when Jesus was was reinstating Peter to the work that was before him. Lovest thou me more than these? Yea, Lord, uh, I love thee. Lovest thou me more than this? Uh, uh, Lord, you know I love thee. 
lovest thou me more than these? Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And then Jesus said, okay, Peter, follow me. Very direct. All right, you love me. You've made your declaration. Follow me. This is so interesting to me because I I find in myself that I identify very easily with Peter. Okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, I love you. Follow me, he says. Okay. And when he had spoken this, this is in John 21. Listen to what he said. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. Then, verse 20, Peter turned about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, And what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Do you understand how quickly this just happened? Peter, do you love me? Yes. Lovest thou me more than thee? Yes. Do you love me? You know all things. You know I love you. Okay, follow me. Jesus, what about him? How quickly... Another person can turn us aside. Another person. Well, well, what about him? And don't you love how Jesus answered? He said, Peter, if, if I want him to be here until I come again, this is what Jesus said. He said, that's none of your business. Follow me. Have you ever gotten a little bothered at the attention that some people get, the attention that they get. Why do they get all that attention? Why do they have that position? Well, why do they get that office? Why do they have those friends? Why do, why do they have that relationship? Why do they? Man, isn't it amazing how quickly another person can captivate our attention? Sometimes good people, good people, like uh, um, um, pastors, uh, tell us what to do. Listen, do we follow other people? Is there such a thing as a leader, biblically speaking? Well, there are. But I will tell you, if you're following a person, you better always have another person in sight as you're following that person. So you might say, oh, I'm I'm following this person because they're, they're helping me in my walk with the Lord. But you better always have in sight not only that person, but the person that they are following. And, and how quickly Peter turned, he turned, Jesus, follow me. Yes. Huh, what about him? The distraction of other people, whether they're godly or not, can so often keep us from the primary focus of following him. You say, how do we do that? Just keep your ears open to the shepherd. Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I know at times we hear the voice of discouragement. This is hard. I know it's hard. Sometimes we hear the voice of fear. What if this doesn't work? What if this fails? What if I'm left alone? I know it's frightening. The voice of weariness. I I don't know how much more I can endure. I know. The voice of failure, I've tried this before. What if I fail again? I know there are a lot of voices that shout in our head, but there's only one that matters. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus is calling you. He's calling me to be followers of Christ. Following him always involves one thing. Paul said it this way. I am crucified. What, what a statement in Paul's day. It's, it's not a light statement in ours. But did you know who he is crucified with? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you were asked today, where are you headed? Are you prepared to say, wherever he leads? We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord. Thanks for joining us today for Rejoice in the Lord. We're so glad you've chosen to be with us as we worship the Lord together through a Bible-based message from Pastor Jeff Redlin, as well as encouraging and inspiring music. You know, music has always been an important part of Rejoice. And we hear often from viewers who tell us they sing along with our congregation and how much they're blessed by the special music each week. This year, as Rejoice in the Lord celebrates 40 years of ministry, we've produced a special offer that allows you to enjoy the best musical moments from 2021. For your gift of $70 or more, we'll send you the two-disc set of 2021's best musical moments. And most importantly, your gift helps sustain this ministry. And we know you'll be blessed as you watch or listen to these musical moments. So call, write, or go online today to request 2021's best musical moments.